accomplished speaker. To avail the e-certificates, everyone is requested to fill the feedback form, the link to which will be circulated at the end of the session in the chat box itself. Without much ado, now I would like to invite Dr. Kamalji Dabas, ma'am, teacher in charge, Department of Zoology, Sri Aurobindo College, University of Delhi. Dr. Kamaljeet Ma'am is an elixir of inspiration and an aureole of guidance to all of us. It is her ardent compassion and zeal that fuels us to achieve milestones each time. Ma'am, I would request you to welcome our honorable speaker, Professor GVR Prasad, and formally begin with the webinar. Thank you. A very warm and cherished morning to our honorable chief guest and speaker of the day, uh, Professor GVR Prasad. Principal Sir, faculty members, and dear students. You all gathered here today in this webinar to acknowledge yourself about the prospects and futures of paleontology in context to evolution of life. We are pleased to have with us Professor Jivya Prasad. He is one of the renowned paleontologists and currently a professor at the Department of Geology, Delhi University. His most exciting finding was 66 million years old fossil that is of the first Cretaceous family that lived in Deccan volcanic province. Within the field of paleontology, Professor Prasad has uh, to his credit a lot of publications like uh, about 125 articles in peer reviewed international journals like Science, Nature and others and over 3,258 citations. He has been a member and chairperson of various national and international uh, boards, committees, advisory committees, okay? And also he is a recipient of many fellowships and awards. I welcome you, sir, for the today's webinar. I also welcome our principal, but somehow because of some technical error, he is not able to join, but he has always been a source of inspiration to us for conducting such activities and has always taken a very keen interest in all these activities. So I also welcome our principal sir, but somehow he's not here. So I ask our right. faculty member to again welcome you, the sir. You're welcome. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your enlightening words. And uh, on behalf of the principal sir and uh, the Department of uh, Zoology, I formally welcome the speaker of the day, Professor GVR Prasad. He is an Indian paleontologist and was the head of the Department of Geology at University of Delhi. His area of interest has been in the studies of Mesozoic vertebrate groups of India. He is honored with a fellow of three major Indian Science Academies, Indian National Science Academy, the other is Indian Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Sciences India, as well the World Academy of Sciences. The Council of Scientific Research, uh, CSIR, awarded him the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize for the Science and Technology, one of the highest Indian science award for his contributions to Earth, Atmosphere, Ocean, Pedantry uh, Sciences in 2003. He is also awarded with the J.C. Bose National Fellowship in recognition of his outstanding performance and scientific pursuits. We are very thankful to you Professor GVR Prasad for sparing the time and I hope our students will be greatly benefited by today's talk. Sir, it's our privilege to have you here in this webinar. I extend the screen space to you and request you to share your thoughts. Sir. I guess when I got disconnected. Please try to contact him. Right.
Uh, ma'am, he is just trying to connect as there is a, some uh, problem of power supply. Okay. We'll just joining okay. in a few minutes. It's fine. It's fine. Yes, Sorry, there was a uh, short uh, break in power supply at Delhi University. Right, sir. Uh, do you think I shall start now? Yes, sir, please. Yeah. Uh, 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 doubts that I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kamaljit Tawas and Dr. Vivek Negi uh, for inviting me to this uh, webinar. Uh, actually, your students have been visiting our, our department on and off to see the public displays in our museum. And uh, uh, this is an opportunity for me to interact with your students. You know, to something in college, which is a least known subject within the science subject. But it is not taught at all at the school level or even at the in most departments. So even geology is not known. So in this uh, talk, I'm basically focusing on. Uh, I think most of the students are. Undergraduate students and uh, uh, they, they are learning what is paleontology and what is science. So I will focus on the uh, what are the fossils and how they are preserved in rocks and how many types of fossils are there and what is the utility of the fossils and also what are the recent developments uh, in the field of paleontology. These these things I'm going to discuss in my uh, talk. Uh, Okay, I, I, I will share my... Can you, can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me make it full screen. So, uh, uh, in this talk, uh, I'll be discussing mostly about the what are fossils, where did they occur, and what are the modes of fossil preservation, and what do fossils tell us, and what are the historical developments in paleontology, and what is the current focus in paleontology. So these uh, things I'll uh, discuss if time permits. Uh, so uh, in Geology, plate tectonics plays a very important role. So it explains most of the ge geological processes, whether they are uh, internal dynamics or the external geological processes, they are explained by means of plate tectonics, how the continents have moved apart and uh, collided with each other. These things are actually discussed mostly in geology. And most of the uh, phenomena in geology are explained by the plate tectonics. Likewise, uh, evolution is actually a, a very unifying uh, theory in biology for understanding how life has changed over time. So, uh, however, our, uh, we cannot see most of these evolutionary changes. Like, for example, the macroevolution, you cannot see uh, 
in your lifetime. So these are the things that happen over millions of years. So for that, we have fortunately we have the fossils, and the uh, by examining fossils and by studying their uh, how the fossils have changed through time, you can actually understand many of these uh, micro as well as macro evolutionary changes. So uh, uh, I think most of you know about the uh, what is a fossil. And in fact, it was first, the name was suggested by Georges Agricola in 1546. Uh, uh, at that time, anything that is uh, taken from the ground, so whether it's a mineral, a rock, or a, a metal, anything is uh, considered, considered as a fossil. So uh, the modern definition actually it says that ev uh, fossils are the evidence of former existence of life. It's not only direct evidence, like for example, uh, skeletons, shells, uh, which are generally known as body fossils. And also we have the leaf impressions, wood, et cetera. These all uh, come under uh, body fossils. Whereas there are also uh, uh, certain indirect evidences, like the activity of the organisms, like the footprints, tracks, and trails, burrows, and borings, tooth marks when the predators attack the prey so they make uh, the tooth marks and eggshells coprolites coprolites are the uh, are the fecal matter and also gastrolites the stomach stones these are uh, the trace fossils so we have two kinds of fossils one is body fossil and the second one is trace fossil body fossils are direct evidence of the uh, organisms and trace fossils are the indirect evidences of the uh, former existence of life so the the science of uh, fossils is known as paleontology as you know and uh, paleontology has several branches like invertebrate paleontology which basically deals with the uh, animals with without backbone and vertebrate paleontology which deals with the animals with backbone like us uh, the humans as well as the fish amphibian reptiles birds and mammals and paleobotany uh, is uh, about the uh, plant fossils, the plant life uh, through time. And then we have the micropaleontology, which is uh, uh, which deals with the uh, organisms which are very small in size, which can be uh, seen only under the microscope. And these are the uh, uh, fossils which are generally used for hydrocarbon exploration, for finding gas and oil, because uh, they help us to know the kind of environment in which the sediments were deposited. And so you can actually uh, find where the, uh, uh, because uh, uh, hydrocarbons are generated from organic material. So you can actually, if you know the uh, environment in which this is generated, then you can actually uh, find out the uh, some of the uh, potential zones of hydrocarbons. And then uh, in recent years, we have also another branch which is known as uh, molecular paleontology which deals uh, primarily with the molecular compounds the organic compounds which are preserved in the rocks and which can be extracted by modern uh, techniques modern uh, uh, sophisticated instrumentation like gc mass uh, ms uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometer and so those uh, things actually provide information about the past life forms uh, of course, they are indirect forms. They are not direct evidences. So uh, you all know that there are three kinds of rocks. One is uh, igneous, the second one is metamorphic, and third one is uh, the sedimentary rocks. And I think you, you know that the fossils are generally found only in sedimentary rocks uh, because these are the uh, rocks which are formed by the weathering erosion of the previously existing rocks like the uh, igneous and metamorphic rocks and then volcanic rocks so the, the and uh, even if the some of the animals die like say for example a volcanic eruption they may not get preserved because because of the heat they get uh, completely decomposed and destroyed and in case of the igneous rocks they are actually brought from the uh, below the earth surface uh, as a magma so they or not, uh, they do not contain any fossils. Whereas metamorphic rocks, which are actually sometimes metamorphic rocks, can be a, a modified uh, 
plutonic igneous rock, rock like a granite, or it could be a modified volcanic rock, or it could be a modified sedimentary rock. So sometimes metamorphic rocks may contain uh, fossils because if it is uh, a, a sedimentary rock which has been transformed into a metamorphic rock because of the high temperature and pressure, then they may contain some evidences of fossils or some fossils, but generally they are highly altered, highly deformed, and they have been subjected to high temperatures, so they become dark in color. So uh, generally they are rare in metamorphic rocks. So it's only sedimentary rocks where you find the uh, fossils. And now the how these fossils form, how they are preserved in rocks. So if you look at these uh, slide, you'll see that uh, the uh, uh, animal, like, like for example, here we have a fish which dies and after death, it, the uh, skeleton initially it may bloat and then subsequently it may uh, settle down to the bottom of the uh, aquatic body. And then the uh, microbes, they act on, they uh, feed on the uh, soft material. So they decompose most of the soft material. What is left behind is the skeleton. And the skeleton, slowly as the sediments accumulate, like the clay, silt, etc., sand, they accumulate over the surface of this of the skeleton. They accumulate in layers and uh, slowly when they accumulate over hundreds of thousands of years, the, we have a thick sequence of rocks a sequence of sediments which get compacted and compacted into rocks. And within these sediments and within the pore spaces of these sediments or the grains like quartz grains or the uh, other grains which are present, in between the grains you have also mineralizing fluids. So these mineral fluids, they are enriched with minerals like silica, calcite, phosphate or pyrite. And so uh, uh, some of these uh, minerals are there and they get deposited once they enter into the pore spaces of the skeletons they actually deposit the uh, these minerals so this is how the uh, skeleton gets uh, petrified or modified into rock or partially modified into rock in many cases they get they completely get replaced in in some cases only partially they get replaced by the minerals. So this is how they get preserved as uh, fossils in the rocks. So we have many types of fossils, as you can see here, some of the body fossils, <coughs> like uh, these are the shells of ammonites. Uh, these are the cephalopods, uh, you know very well, you are zoology students. So these are uh, extinct uh, group of uh, uh, animals, which were present in the uh, marine waters, and you can see beautifully preserved uh, suturing ornamentation on the surface of these uh, animals. And also, we have the body fossils in the vertebrates, for example, we have the sharks. Sharks, uh, generally, sh in case of sharks, only the teeth are preserved as fossils, whereas uh, the other parts of the skeleton, teeth and spines and the uh, dermal denticles. These are the only things which get preserved, whereas the rest of the skeleton doesn't get preserved as fossil because it, it consists of the skeleton consists of cartilage. And cartilage, as you know, it it de uh, decomposes easily on, uh, on exposure to the atmospheric conditions. So uh, uh, sharks generally, they get mostly preserved in the form of these uh, teeth. And then you have skeletons of fish like this. And these are not very common. This is an exceptional preservation. And then wood, like this is a, a wood of about uh, 18 feet uh, long, uh, 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 which is found in South India, in the Cretaceous rocks of South India. And then we have the pollens. Pollens, of course, these are the most common uh, uh, fossils which are found in the sediments and they are very small in size. Some of them are mostly, they are less than 200 microns in size. And these pollens, they, in many sedimentary rocks where we don't find any other fossils, these are the only things which get preserved because the conditions for the preservation of uh, uh, the pollens is the reducing environment. So if reducing environment is there, the pollens and spores, they get preserved easily. If there are oxidizing conditions, the pollens get destroyed easily because as you know, most of the plant material gets destroyed by oxidation. 
And then you have the plant impressions like this, which are again body fossils. So you have the leaf impressions from the Carboniferous time, and then you have the uh, famous Glossopteris uh, uh, plant leaf, uh, which is known essentially from the Gondwana continents. So uh, the difference between the two is that here you don't see any organic material or the carbon film on the surface of the leaves. Here you'll see this uh, black colored carbon film or carbon coating after the decomposition of the all the uh, uh, other organic material. What is left behind is the carbon film. So these are generally in plant uh, you know, or the paleobotanists, they generally call them as uh, compressions and these are known as impressions where there is no organic material, they are known as impression. This is known as compression. And uh, the another important mode of mineralization or the, or the fossilization is permineralization. Permineralization is the process. As I told you earlier, the mineralizing fluids, when they enter into the pore spaces of the, like here we have the bone and you can see lots of pore spaces here in between you have the bone marrow. So these can be easily get uh, on the uh, uh, with the filled with the uh, minerals which are deposited by the fluids which are present in the sediments. So the the mineralizing fluids they actually they result in the formation of the pen permineralized bone and also the wood. Uh, this is common in wood. Also in most of the cases in wood the uh, Original organic material is completely replaced by the uh, uh, silica or ch chert, uh, for example. And so this is uh, basically uh, a petrified, that's why we call it as petrified wood. And uh, in many cases, of course, the, the entire bone or wood is not completely replaced by the uh, minerals. It is partially replaced by the uh, minerals. Then we have uh, some example, best examples for the petrified woods like this, tree trunks, and you have the Yellowstone National Park where you can see at least four, 14 stories of uh, forests. So you have a, a, a sequence of rocks, like here you have the um, uh, uh, sedimentary sequence, which contains the vertically oriented in, in their natural position, uh, most of these plants. And then you have another layer, another layer here, like that, and in between, you have the volcanic flows. So uh, there is a, an episodic volcanism here and which destroyed the forest. And so whenever there was a volcanic activity, they were covered by the volcanic flows. So in in such a situation, most of the plants are destroyed and they, are, they occur in erect position like this. So we have uh, close to our um, home, we have the uh, National Fossil Park at Gugua in uh, Madhya Pradesh near Mandla. And this has lots of uh, wood fossils uh, uh, preserved in some of them, or you can see the roots uh, also uh, in the wood. And then the, there is another mode of preservation, which is known as cast and molds. Cast and molds are the, uh, these are actually the, uh, once the organic material, whether it's a wood, or a, a bone, anything which is preserved in the sediment. So it, if suppose it gets dissolved, it completely uh, gets decomposed. Then what is left behind is the cavity. And this cavity is actually the mold for the cast. It, so subsequently, if some sediments or these minerals uh, get filled within the cavity, they will form the cast. So as you also see lots of uh, statues are being made out of the molds. So in the same manner, you have the cast and mold, uh, which are common in the fossils. And this, uh, of course, they do not contain any organic matter. They're essentially, they are made up of rock. And, uh, but you can see all the structures on the external surface and the ornamentation, in the nodes here where the leaves are attached. So these are the, some of the uh, plants from the Carboniferous time, and these are the uh, these openings that you see. Is that the, these are the places where the roots are attached. So these are the root. This is a root genus of the Carboniferous time. So uh, here, what you see here is a trilobite, is a marine animal which lives which lived between 540 and 250 million years, and you can see here 
a, a negative and the negative gets filled with if it gets filled with the uh, sediment it will form the cast like this so a positive will form so molds and casts are nothing but negatives and uh, positives and then compaction compaction is very common in sediments uh, rocks as they get deposited layer by layer the uh, in course of time because of the overburden because huge thickness of sediments are deposited so because of this compaction of the sediments will take place and then finally the most of the materials like the plant material for example if you have plant material uh, buried within the sediment so it gets flattened or it loses the volume so from a let us say you have a wood uh, fragment so this if it has a circular a spherical outline it will get distorted and it will become oval or uh, elliptical in shape because of the uh, compaction then we have uh, conditions like encrustations like this so in many cases it has been found that nodules carbonate nodules they contain fossils so if you break them uh, 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 the nodule you will find inside fossils like here you can see a fish skeleton so this comes from the jurassic rocks of uh, pranahita godavari valley in telangana and uh, you can see from the outer side when uh, we collected the sample it looked like this but when you break it you will find these skeletons so the skeleton becomes uh, it forms the nucleus for the formation of the uh, nodule around which the ca calcium carbonate accumulates so this takes place mostly in conditions where there is a reduced